Welcome to worship. We're having a whole host of technical issues this morning, so bear with us. As you see, there's no computer, so no slides today. Today is Palm Sunday. In the baskets in the back, you'll find these palm crosses. Please take one. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're glad you're here and that we hope that you will share your worship experience with your friends and your family, whether it's online or right here in the sanctuary. We invite you to join us during Holy Week, this coming week, Monday, Thursday service with communion is April 1st. That service will be at 5 p.m. And then the Good Friday Tenebrae service is April 2nd, also at 5 p.m. And the next Sunday, Easter Sunday, we'll have Easter services at 8.15 and 10.30 a.m. Both of those services will be with Holy Communion. Every year we decorate the sanctuary with Easter lilies and to help us decorate, you can purchase lilies in honor or memory of loved ones. We've pre-ordered 30 plants and so far we've only had 12 purchase, so we need your help with that. If you're able, would you please order an Easter lily? There are forms on that table in the narthex. You can drop them in the offering baskets or in the office. Mark your calendars. Next Sunday, April 4th at 10 a.m., the Children's Ministry Program will be holding an Easter egg hunt for children and families of our congregation. We invite all children up through the fifth grade. They need to bring a basket and then join us in the fun. In addition, we need your help. We need donations of plastic eggs filled with candies, stickers, and small toys to use for the hunt. You can drop the eggs off in the office or in the narthex. There's a basket in the narthex between now and April 1st. The United Methodist women are selling adorable antique doll cradles with lots of cute accessories for just $50, just in time for the perfect Easter gift for all the little girls in your life. All proceeds go to missions for the UMW. Please contact Corinne Birkeland at 210-859- 8060 to place your order. Meals on Wheels is in need of volunteers. Meals are currently delivered to clients in UC shirts in the Cibolo area on Mondays and Wednesdays. If you're interested in this program that provides meals for people right here in our own community and you can make deliveries at least one day a month or more, we'd love to have you on the team. Please call Helen Eklund at 210-710- 0474. The office needs people to help us with our campus bulletin boards to keep them updated and better utilized. If you wouldn't mind helping, please let Amanda in the office know. She will assist you in providing all the materials needed to decorate these bulletin boards. And it's scholarship time again. Applications for the annual UCUMC $500 scholarship and the policy with all of the eligibility criteria are available in the church office. Completed applications with required materials should be delivered to the church office or postmarked by Friday, April 2nd, 2021. Finally, and this is important, if you have a prayer concern, if you desire a deeper connection with this faith community, or if you'd like a call from Pastor Cynthia or a member of our care team, please contact the church office. And if you know of someone who is looking for a faith connection, please help us connect with them. Better yet, invite them to church with you. We live to serve, to love, and to grow. Now it's time for our mission moment. This month, Urban Faith Mission, Scott Kilbasa. Good morning, church. So good to be here this morning. And uh, hopefully that win means the Holy Spirit is with me. I don't know if it does, but hopefully. I want to thank Allison Buck and the Mission Board for reaching out to us. Uh, We always need the help, and so to receive that phone call was great. Also want to thank Becky and the Youth Ministry for coming out each month and helping us uh, this last year. I can't say enough her attitude, and just she's always just like... uh, what do, you, what do you need help with? And I'm like, I have a church that's committed to us once a month and they're willing to do whatever I ask. I mean, that's just a gift from heaven. So 
thank uh, Becky a lot for what her, you know, leading that and so forth. I also want to kind of clue you in on what Becky is doing a little bit and how she fits in with sort of the master plan. So somebody just asked me how did Corona hit us this year and how did it affect us? And honestly, I'm on the west side of San Antonio. It's the poorest area of the city. And I'm on this island. It's called uh, lower income housing. And, you know, anytime you're in a real poor area, there's all kinds of things that just get worse. And when kids can't go to school and they can't escape those areas, it just falls in on them. And so the confidence in those areas has just really been shaken. Somebody also asked, how are you working with these kids? You know, well, we actually got the green light from San Antonio Housing Authority to start doing outside kids clubs, but they wanted us to limit it to like 10. I'm like, there's so many kids just on our main location. How can I limit it to 10? So I started thinking about these other managers and these other islands, and they've been wanting us to come out. And I said, well, let's go and let's start many kids clubs in these areas. And one of the, the strategies is when you come into these areas, you got to do a little outreach to bring in God's presence. And that's where Becky comes in and the youth. They're helping me to break into these areas. They helped us to break into Cassiano, which is another island down the street from uh, um, Lincoln. And cooking a little hot dogs, doing some activities for kids. But the goal of doing that outreach is to tell those kids, hey, I'd like to see you each week for discipleship, to learn the Bible. And so, uh, and then once we start doing the weekly Bible studies, I can make a connection with the moms and start doing a type of mom support with, uh, with the mothers in those areas. So that's already begun in Cassiano, and we actually have an idea of paying our moms too, to be a host home in those areas. So we're actually paying one of the moms $300 a month that she can't make more than 3,000, otherwise she loses her benefits. She has seven kids, but the goal is to disciple her and for her hopefully to start like a moms in prayer outreach in her little area. And so, and also for us to continue to do weekly discipleship for the kids. So there's two more areas, Mirasol, which Becky has been out to, and Alizon, which, uh, she's gonna to try to help us to break into those two areas. And we continually need the rotation of Becky down there, mainly because you gotta to continue to bring in God's presence. It supports our weekly discipleship program. And so I just wanna just let you know that this is a great vision. We already have our main campus, but this is how God's expanding us right now. Also with that, I'm taking the youth each week to go, our youth at our main location, we have about 10 to 15 youth that we work with. They are now going out to do the kids' Bible studies with me, which means that we're training them how to be the church to each other. Because if it's always just me being the church for everybody, well, the moment I die, they're not gonna know how to be God or to be Jesus to one another. So we gotta teach them how to be Jesus to each other. And so really good things are happening with God's vision in this, in this whole thing. But I just wanted you to know how Becky's fitting in with all this, how y'all's church is fitting in with this. So the ask is $2,700. I know it's a big ask and I'm in whether we get there or not, I need to ask it, but it covers nine months of uh, feeding 30 kids uh, each week. Uh, that roughly, that's roughly about $2.50 a kid providing them a meal so that we're not just talking about Jesus with empty words, but we're also providing a family atmosphere for them. Now you might say, you're only ministering to 30 kids. Actually, we're ministering to about 100 kids once we get these other two locations done, but we're only able to feed 30. And so we're gonna go for just our main location, ministering a little bit more to those kids and youth. But we do provide snacks and fruits and stuff like that to our other kids. But the goal is, at the, if I can ever reach enough funding, I think we could potentially be discipling 160 kids a month. And uh, now that sounds uh, crazy, but I believe it is achievable. And we, we are finding these unreached areas in our city. You wouldn't believe there's just no activity from the local church, none from the local churches down there. And obviously there's geographical challenges for churches that are separated. But God has really put it on my heart that I, and I was talking with Allison, I can't do this mission alone. It's important, God doesn't just care about the lost, 
and cares about the heart of the church. And so if you find it in your heart to help us, then that's, uh, that, it, it's, it's our responsibility, these areas in our city. It's, it's absolutely all of ours. It's not just, uh, hey, Scott's doing a good job. I need you guys to be with us. And, and we're thankful for y'all. We only have about three churches right now that are, are, are really helping us. And so really thankful for you giving me your attention today. I'm not gonna stick around uh, because the youth ministry is coming down there and I attended the first service, but uh, I love what the pastor is doing here and I, I've always loved the people here. It's a great church. Just wanna just uh, encourage all of y'all. Y'all still have a lot of fire in y'all and let's, let's push through this uh, storm of this last year and uh, I believe in good things for this church. Love y'all, God bless y'all. Thank you, Scott. Let's enter into a time of silence as we prepare for worship. Please join me in the call to worship. From water to wilderness, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. On stone and in hearts, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. From the ancestor of nations to the sun lifted up, God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. We follow Jesus on the Lenten path. For where he is, we will be also. Thank you. 
Dios llama hoy para seguirle con amor y fe. Mientras mil voces resuenan por doquier, Hosanna que tiene el nombre del Señor. Con un aliento de gran exclamación, prorrumpen con voz triunfal. Hosanna, Hosanna. Good morning. I'm glad to see some loves here. It makes me happy. Um, so today we remember Palm Sunday and Jesus' um, arrival in Jerusalem riding a donkey. And, you know, they had a parade and they waved palm branches and they shouted the word Hosanna. I wonder if you know what that means. I wonder if you know why we use palm branches. You know, a long time ago, while Jesus was ministering, the area in which he lived, there were a lot of deserts. And deserts are these dry places where not much grows, and it can be a long way from water to water. But the funny thing about the desert is when the wind blows, it changes completely, and it will look very different from one minute to another. It is very easy to lose your way there. So in these dry, sandy, hot places, people learned to look for palm trees because they represented places where you could often find water. And so there was shade and water and a place to rest and a place to be safe. And palm trees became known as a symbol of safety and sanctuary and home. So when Jesus marched into Jerusalem on that, sun, on that um, Palm Sunday, the palm branches were a way of waving to him that he was safe, that he was home, that people were glad to see him. And we know that as we go through Holy Week, it does not stay so safe. We know that the things and the story changes. We know that there is a lot of darkness in this week. But we also know, much like the desert, that with Jesus and with God, we are safe. And in places like this church, we have a place to call home and to be safe and to be loved. I wonder how that makes you feel. We pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for giving us this church to feel like home. Help us to share your safety and love with others. Amen. Anybody who wants to come to Children's Church? Israel, soon on he appeareth, riding on a donkey's back, king of all is he. Love will the streets rebound, what a bright triumphant sound, what a joyful dancing day, our salvation comes. Sing
Thank you. We have two altar flower arrangements this morning. The first provided by Allison and Kim Buck in honor of Bob's 70th birthday today. And the second provided by Kim Buck in celebration of Bob and Allison's 48th wedding anniversary this coming Wednesday. This morning we celebrate that Nathan Durham is now recovering at home after spending a night in the hospital due to dehydration and increased heart rate. But Scott told me this morning he is home and doing much, much better. We have these concerns this morning. Bob Riddle has had 10 radiation treatments to contain his cancer, and he's handled them well. He is currently set up with home hospice. One of our preschool families has a son who was born prematurely and has been in the NICU since birth with respiratory issues. Amanda Cohen's college friend, Tiffany Goff, is recovering from breast cancer surgery this past week. Jane Edwards remains in the hospital, but she's doing better. She's had a lot of tests and they've uh, ruled some things out, but there's still no firm diagnosis. Dave Berkland is having hip replacement surgery tomorrow morning. Pastor Linda Baumheckel's sister, Carol, had back surgery on Thursday that was unsuccessful. She was in extreme pain and had a second surgery Friday, which was more successful, and she's had some relief from the pain. Ruth Hickman was in the ER Thursday and was admitted for another bout of colitis. She was released yesterday afternoon, however. And Robert Schneider's daughter, Susan, had foot surgery on Friday and now is recovering at home. Would you join me in prayer? Loving and gracious and merciful God, we gather in your house this morning with joy. We bring together our hearts and our voices in praise and thanksgiving for all that you do for us, for all that you've done for us. We thank you for the rain this morning we thank you that we have so much. We look around at our neighbors who have less and can do nothing but praise you and thank you. We ask that you make us more compassionate, more loving, more giving to help those around us who suffer and those who have less. Where we have sinned and where we have fallen short, we ask that you open our eyes and help us repent and forgive us. Help us feel your grace and your mercy. Help us be more graceful and merciful for those who have sinned against us, who has wronged us. We pray for our men and women who serve at home and around the world to protect us and guarantee these freedoms that we enjoy. We pray for our leaders in the country and in our state as they make decisions that deal with all these issues that we face. We pray especially for our medical personnel. We're thankful for them. We're thankful that the COVID-19 pandemic is on the decline and we pray that it continues. Help us do no harm and continue to practice those safe practices that are essential. And we pray all of these things boldly as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Shall fancy his blessing. 
The scripture, re uh, scripture reference today is Psalms 118, 1 and 2, and then we're going to skip down and do 19 through 29. Um, Jesus referenced these words when he was, um, when the people were against him. O oh God, thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. What a joy. It is a joy to see you all. And uh, every time I listen to this particular psalm, I think of um, the song, My Children and I, as we had about a 30-minute commute in the morning. Uh, we, we lived in Schulenburg out in the countryside. My office, their school, our church was in Columbus. And we'd get in the car, we'd load up, and I'd start out, this is the day. And they'd sing back, this is the day. It's such a happy memory. This is one of those beautiful passages that has so many phrases that are, you know, ingrained in, in our soul and in our thinking, in our formation. And it's Palm Sunday. So the story is that we know so well, you know, Jesus is coming in on the back of a borrowed donkey. And the people gather around him. They've heard stories. They are intrigued. They are very curious about this man, Jesus. Some of them, no doubt, had heard him preach. Perhaps some had been present for the miracles. Perhaps some had been touched and been healed. And they came out, Jesus was coming into town. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But less known to us is the story also that on the other side of town, Rome was coming in. The governor of Judea would be coming in, not on the back of a donkey, but in full power and force. Because you see, the way that Rome kept peace, Pax Romana, was through force. And so in this festival season of Passover, when the people would gather and uh, there was a tendency for unrest, well, Rome would show up in force, power of the world, the power of Rome, the legions, the soldiers, the garrisons, the governor. So on one side of town, you have Jesus coming in and the people are there to greet him. I'm sure that there were people there to greet the governor also. Those who found it intoxicating to be close to power. Those who might have personal ambition and want to be visible in support of power. And those who were simply afraid of power. And that day, there were two processions. There was Jesus coming in, the Prince of Peace. There was the governor of Judea, representative of power. And for the disciples, those who were intrigued by, curious, following this Jesus of whom they had heard so much, those who did not yet know what the power of God looked like, 
They came and they also had their own duality, dichotomy going on because you see as they were there laying down their coats, their garments for the donkey to walk over, and just a few days later, they were gone. It is good that Palm Sunday comes around once a year. I think that it keeps us mindful that we are always those who are living in the midst of dichotomies. We are always those in the, the realm of Christ who are trying to be Christ in the presence of these dualities. That there is the power of the world, which is at best deeply flawed and very often quite corrupt. And then there is the power of God's grace that we know in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the power of love, for the goodness of grace, that your love, which can be overcome by nothing. And so we ask that you stir in our hearts, we who love you, who worship Christ, that you open your word that we might receive it this day, for we do ask it in his name. Amen. We're also in our last Sunday in the season of Lent, and I hope that many of you did stick to your disciplines, whatever they may have been, whether it was giving up something. I think I mentioned on our first Sunday of Lent that it is good, it is good sometimes to give up food that we might experience hunger, that we might know something of what it is to be without food in the house or on the table. Hunger is a good thing. It awakens our senses, and we have greater compassion for those who go without. It is good that we might have a blood sugar, not quite right headache in the morning when we wake up after not having eaten the day before because it helps us understand what it is to be a child of poverty who shows up in school with an empty stomach. Amen. And for those of you maybe who took on another kind of discipline, a discipline of generosity, I pray that you have experienced, that you know now the joy, the liberation of overcoming the fear of scarcity and not enough when you simply give and give joyfully as we are able. For others, I hope maybe that you have tried to surrender something to surrender something because in our here I am, God says to God's people, your light shines through. Your light shines through and I say to my people, I God, here I am. I meet you in your here I am, this sacred space, this threshold, holy ground. I hope that you have had opportunity to practice and when we fail to get back up and try again the next day. Because here we are closing out our season of Lent and getting ready to enter into Holy Week and Monday, Thursday, when we will remember our Lord's Last Supper, our Lord's Supper, the sacrament of communion and the promise that we might be joined with God through Christ and each other for ministry in the world. And there is Good Friday and the sacrifice of Christ, which is complete so that our sins might be forgiven, that we might live as redeemed people, and then there is the joy of Easter, of resurrection, of new life, and celebration. And we who are disciples, those who follow Jesus, those who have met Jesus, encountered him, have been touched by, healed by Jesus, there is something other we have that those first disciples on Palm Sunday did not. We have been through Holy Week already. We know of Easter resurrection. We live redemption. We understand and participate in Pentecost, the gifting of the Holy Spirit the birthing and the life of church, 
the presence of Christ, of goodness, hope, and grace in the world, even by those so very, very flawed. Talking about myself now. So we've got this gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, isn't that something? I, I had a girlfriend once. She was a very emphatic person, a very strong-willed person, a very faithful, devoted Christian, but she also had a bit of a temperament. And she was telling a story to me one time about how it is that God had been on her back telling her that she was supposed to give this coat that she really, really liked. I really, really liked this coat. God was telling me that I was supposed to give it away, not just to anybody, but to this particular person who I did not like. She was a teaching colleague of mine. I knew her well. I didn't like anything about her, did not want to be in the meeting room with her, and yet God is telling me not just once, but again and again and again, you are to give your coat to this person that I do not like. So she said one day, She slammed her hand down on the desk. She said, that's it. Lord, here I go. So, you know, you just feel the love in this now, can't you? She takes off that coat. She marches down the hall. She slams it on the desk of her colleague and said, I don't know why, but God keeps telling me I'm supposed to give this coat to you. There. (laughs) And then this woman, who she considered to be so difficult and so very, very hard, started to melt right in front of her eyes and she said, I don't talk about it around here because I don't need the judgment. But my husband left and it's been everything I can do to keep my children warm and I don't have a jacket. So my good friend, now humbled, right, goes back to her classroom and said, thank you, Lord. Thank you for not giving up on me. There's another story of a gentleman who uh, had worked hard to move up the ranks in this company. It was a family-owned company. There wasn't a lot of opportunity for advancement, but he had been there. He had done the hard work. He had earned the trust. He had earned his way up the ranks. He had a place of authority and position and a good paycheck and a home. And then in came, uh, through the doorway, a new employee. This young man had a wife and two children, and uh, he was very talented. He was very good at his work, but what the older man knew is there was no opportunity for this young man to advance. There simply weren't the openings for that possibility. He said, the Lord started speaking to me and saying, it's time for you to go. Yeah, it's taken a long time for me to get to where I am, Lord, The Lord kept telling him, it's time for you to go. And it would be good for you to give this young man and his family your home. Wow. So this went on, and one day the man did go in, and he put in his resignation, and he went to the young man, and he said, my position is now your position, and here are the keys to my house. So church, you know, when we put out the petition for maybe it's time to sign up for choir, I'm just saying, we could ask for a whole lot more. It's not us anyway, it's God, right? How is God stirring in your heart? I'm looking at Allison, I'm thinking about the conversation that is breaking open, and we met here in the sanctuary a handful of weeks ago, and we started trying to listen to the Lord and what the Lord was stirring in our hearts but it will take people saying, yes, Lord, here I am to make things happen. I was so very, very touched by Scott's um, presentation this morning and his explanation of what it is that they are doing on the west side of San Antonio, that their presence there is about transformation. It's about helping people who are in poverty, most especially the children have food in their bellies, good food in their bellies. It's about having hope in the neighborhood where they are living so that their future might be different than the future of their parents and perhaps grandparents and aunts and uncles. It's about being the body of Christ in a place that very often is left alone. And then we heard how our youth group, Becky, is taking our young people out there every month, that new relationships are being 
formed. As Becky and I were talking, and I hope this is okay, she was telling me about the impression it was making on our children, our youth, when they see how very privileged and blessed they are compared to the lives of other young children who are playing, and where are their people? Where are their people? To which our very wise youth director said, today we are their people because we are here. The body of Christ, the presence of Christ in a place very often left to their own devices. Scott's work there for several years there, trying to pull things together. Now I'm gonna tell you part of the story that you probably don't know. And that is that they came this close yesterday to not going, our youth. Not because they did not have the will to go, not because they did not have the desire to go, not because plans had not been made, but because they did not have a second safe gathering certified adult to go with them. And that is a deal breaker. So our young people ready to go almost did not go because we, church, were not able to provide them not only with that second person safe gathering a certified. Beyond that, this is not just about rules, it's not just about policy, it's about who we are and what that means. Enabling our young people to come up in faith not just this, but think about your wisdom. Think about your story. Think about how it is that you might be that listening ear to another young person. They are discovering who they are also in a world that is filled with false narrative about what power and goodness is. And your story is a story of about grace. It's about love. It's about hope. You own it. You have it. It dwells in you. But it does no good until we give it away. You see, that is part of the story of Palm Sunday, the dualities, the stories that are out there, the myths that people believe. And we are those who bear the story of the gospel. We are those who bear hope in a world so badly broken. There is this other story in our Palm Sunday story, and it's largely mystery. We have to read between the lines, but you know, the donkey on which Jesus rode was a borrowed donkey, right? A borrowed burrow. There was a man who owned that burrow. We do not know his name. We do not know what he looked like. We do not know if he was there that day to welcome Jesus into town. We do not know if he showed up to wave palms and put down his robe. He may have been on the other side of town to welcome in the governor. We don't know. But we know he had a donkey and we know he gave it away. And because of that, our story is what our story is. So maybe the message today on Palm Sunday as we revisit this very familiar story, as we think about who we are and what that means, struggling always with the dichotomies, dualities, the false narratives, learning to trust, learning to surrender, learning to give, maybe one of the most important things that we can do is remember that we all have a donkey to give away to. And I don't know if it looks like a coat or a job or a house or your time and your prayers and your service and your story and your willingness to say to the world, to say to one another, to say to our youth, here I am. Here I am. 
It's the undertold story of Palm Sunday. Amen. I would invite you to stand as able and join me in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As has been our custom during this COVID period, we will not be passing the offering plates today. We do have baskets at the back of the sanctuary. In addition to leaving an offering in the basket, if you're unable to do that today, or if you're visiting us online, there are a number of other ways that you can give to Christ Church here at UC. You can give to, by texting to UC UMCTX to 73256. You can give online through the realm. Uh, you can give by clicking the online button on our church website. You can obviously send your check-in in the mail, or you can give through your bank using bill pay. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, as we bring our gifts and lay them at your altar, we remember the crowds in Jerusalem who laid their cloaks on the road, shouting, Hosanna, as Jesus passed. We know they were looking for a Messiah who was different from the one you sent. Not one of political power and military might, but one who came in compassion and mercy to heal, love, and save. Gracious God, search our hearts that we might be confident that the Messiah for whom we long is the one you know we need. Jesus Christ, our anointed one, it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 434, Fourth in Thy Name, O Lord. as we enter into Holy Week, anticipating, we cannot help it, Easter. Let us be mindful as you go forward that we all have a donkey to give. And just like that first donkey, it bears the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the power to heal and transform of the Holy Spirit. So go with courage and go in peace. Amen.